Okay, well, good morning. Can everybody hear me? You have the head mic turned on? Okay. Making sure she's still relying on my instruction, which, hey, lights are on. We're good to go. Um, <laughs> well, good morning, uh, Kent Christian Church. I, I can't, again, I'm excited. I've drank too much coffee this morning. Um, I, I was able to teach through Sunday school, so I am warmed up. I hope that you are ready. Um, I'm beyond ready. And any time that I get to open up God's Word and kind of do this, I get excited anyways. Um, so hope you have your running shoes on. Um, not really. We're going to walk through this. It's going to be um, a great day. And um, I hope that you had a wonderful week. I really hope that you are able to live out some of the stuff we talked about last week, right? This new, uh, my ministry plan, my ministry model. Hopefully you guys will come along uh, with me in this. And that was three steps Right? Love God, love others, and to love Canton. Um, and, and last week's message is kind of, it was a standalone message. Um, but I, I really felt like it needed some follow-up over the next couple of weeks. Matter of fact, four weeks. We're going to be looking at um, next steps. So what are next steps? Well, the next steps are, are what you do to uh, complete, to, to finish your initial goal. Right? My initial goal is to love God, love others, love Canton. So what are, what are my next steps? Um, and if you missed last week's message, you can jump on the church website at www.cantoncc.com. You go to resources, and you can look at the messages there, Jim's messages. Uh, it's a great way to keep up if you miss a, a weekend or whatever that looks like. Um, so what are our next steps? Well, it's easy, right? Well, to love God... Right, with everything that makes you who you are, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, everything that Yahweh created you to be is our first step. Second step is to love others. You love out of that overflow of God. And when you love others, you can't help but love Canton. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, before we dig into your word, and before we have um, your wisdom, have your insights speak life into our lives. Um, God, let us humble ourselves. Remember what it is that we're doing here. God, we don't just come on Sundays because that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, God, we come on Sundays to encounter you. So God, I pray for that this morning. God, let our ears be made ready to hear, our minds made ready to understand, and our hearts made ready to accept your message for us today. God, I thank you. God, I love you. And it's in the most powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So one of our goals as a church, and I'm talking about Big C Church, like global church, and I'm talking about church here, Kenton Christian Church, as a body, is to grow in number. And not just number, but to grow in depth. Right? Have you ever seen a, a big tree? I mean, a big old tree that gets blown over in a windstorm crazy thing is you can look at the roots of that tree and they may be wide and I mean wide big enough that five six people can stand arm in arm and barely reach the edges but they don't go very deep you can look at a tree a quarter of its size and it's standing as straight as it can be why is that it's deep its roots may not go super wide but I tell you what they do they go really deep that's our goal as a church is to grow in number and grow in depth. And not just so that we can feel better about ourselves, um, but because Jesus commanded us to grow. Right, we're going to look at something here, and I don't, if you don't know this by heart, I encourage you to learn it. Um, if you don't take this seriously, I encourage you to take it seriously. Um, this last thing that Jesus said before he ascended back to heaven, and this is his closest friends. Now, this isn't a sermon he was preaching at a tabernacle or, or anything like that. He was talking to the men he had done life with for three years. They'd walked everywhere together. they traveled. They've had the hardships, the ups, the downs, everything that's involved in ministry and life, they've walked through together. And this is what he tells the, his closest confidants, his friends. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given... All authority in heaven and on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands 
I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. This is called the Great Commission. We have all been called to be uh, disciples, right? We've been all, all have been called on this mission. You have been given ownership in this. You have been given responsibility in this. We are now on mission with Jesus. That's a beautiful thing, right? We have been called to go and make, not to sit and take. So Jesus wants us to reach out to those who are not part of us yet, right? Church is a beautiful thing, what we get to do here, but this is such a small portion of what it is we're supposed to do. This is where we're fed. This is where we're re-energized for the next week. This is where we come together and we support each other. We walk with each other. We help to carry each other's burdens. We do life together. But this is just a blip in your week. Think about it. If you're here for Sunday school and hang out afterwards, you might be here for three hours. What about the rest of the week? That's when we live out this great commission. That's when we go to the nations. We go to our neighbors, maybe our coworkers, people down the street, whatever it is, and and we share the gospel message with them. Now, this isn't just to reach out to others to bring them to church, right? We don't want to bring the unchurched to church. We want to bring the unchurched to be churched. Now, if it's just about numbers and not discipleship, if it's just about numbers and not doing life and just about numbers and not all the other intricacies that we get uh, to do with others we're blessed with, there are easier ways to do this. I came up with four really easy ways to just add numbers. One, offer swag bags. If you don't know what that is, any of the award shows that you go to now, people don't actually go for the awards that they might win. They go for the bag of goodies they get just for showing up. And it's full of expensive gifts. You don't ever, after shows, they don't talk about the awards ceremony. They break down the bag, gift by gift. Now, if we just want to bump numbers, by all means, let's give gifts. Let's just give gifts away. It'd be so much easier. How about number two, major guilt trips. That'll get somebody here. You guilt them into coming. That's not good. Number three, mass kidnapping. (laughs) It's illegal. We'd have bumper crowds one Sunday, and the next we'd be empty. We'd be in jail. Or or how about uh, holding our service at the Chesapeake Energy Arena during halftime? Captivated audience. We'd have thousands of people for a couple hours. If it's just about numbers, man, we're missing it. Our roots are going wide, not going deep. We all know something more has to happen uh, if the connection is really going to last. If you're going to be able to weather the storm, which Jesus tells you, you're going to have to weather storms in life. If you're going to have to weather the storm, there's got to be more to it than just coming on Sunday morning. There's more to it than just checking a box. We could get record numbers by doing these silly things of people coming to church. Uh, But then we'd have to do something the next week just as spectacular. And the week after, and the week after. And if we didn't, people lose interest and they just walk away. As great as the first week would be, the rest would just be a letdown. Now, we kind of see this every springtime. Everybody and their mother comes to church on Easter. Right? It's... it's, uh, in the pastoral world, you got two weekends. You work all year for two weekends. That's Easter weekend and, and Christmas. Um, because everybody and their mother comes on Chris, Christmas and Easter, especially Easter. And we love that. We enjoy that. We celebrate those people coming. We should never make them feel bad. I will never stand up here and say, hey, I haven't seen you since last year. How's life? That's not what this is about. They already get that. They feel that. So we welcome them. We love them. We do everything we can to make that experience as authentic as it possibly can be. But how discouraging is the next weekend? The hard part is is if people fall away. Right? How many people know someone who was once on fire for God? Now they aren't. Right? How many of us would be willing to admit that maybe this is part of our own story, that at one point we were hot for God. We were on fire. We were running. Now we struggle to even get out of bed on Sunday mornings and make it to church on time. We all have this. We all have this at some time in our lives. It's just the ebb and flow of being human. 
Now, there are big fallaways, like when someone makes the intentional decision to walk away from God. And God mourns that choice. We mourn that choice. Now, if that has ever been you, uh, right, or, or any of this has been you at all with the on fire, not so much now, you need to know that when you come back, when that fire is reignited, Jesus isn't looking down from heaven, shaking his saying, saying, well, it's about time. He doesn't say it's too late. What he is doing, he's smiling. He's rejoicing. And he's saying, welcome home. If you don't believe me, look at the Bible. One of my favorite stories, the prodigal son. Right, That son willingly walks away from his father to live a life that is just rambunctious at best. Right, He, he lives a life full of selfishness and desire until he just can't anymore. He's empty, and what does he do? He comes home, and he's shunned by his dad. No. The father sees his son walking at a distance, and he runs out to meet him, and he embraces him. He welcomes him home. How much more do you think God does the same for us? With the huge fallaways, like willingly walking away from God, there are subtle fallaways, too. People who uh, wouldn't know it just by looking at you, but maybe... This may be, hear me out here. Your faith isn't quite as strong as it once was because of life. Maybe the struggles are heavy. You're trying to carry all of these burdens all on your own. And it's just hard. The passion you had isn't as strong today as it once was. Now those subtle ones, they can last a few months. They can last a couple of weeks, a couple of days. They can even last a couple of hours. Pastors are not immune to this. Elders are not. Leaders are not immune to this. There's a big difference, though. Um, we have to have this figured out by the weekend. We can't live in those moments just as you can't live in those moments because you'll suffocate. You'll drown in those emotions. They'll become too much. You will be overwhelmed. I can tell you that Mondays are the worst day of the week for me. It's not because it's a Monday. right? It's because I am spiritually, emotionally, and mentally drained by the end of Sunday. Because, um, and you can ask anybody that stands up here and does this, I'll tell you the exact same thing. Because it's just draining. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I do not want to do anything else for the rest of my life. But Mondays are hard. Now, if any of this has connected with you at any level, right, today is for us. I say us because, well, I, I kind of wrote this, so I'm dealing with some of these things. Right, anytime we open up the Word of God, it's to bring life and truth and freshness and joy and, and conviction into our lives. Whether you're new to this whole Jesus thing, or, or maybe it's been a long time since you've been here, or, or maybe you're here every single Sunday, this is the perfect week for us. Today we're going to be talking about how we actually grow the way Jesus wants us to grow, that spiritual maturity. Right, if you have your bulletin, you notice in there that we're talking about training versus trying. There's a big difference between the two. Training versus trying. Now, I can try to go run a marathon. <laughs> Don't laugh. I might be able to do it. I'll hit a mile and a half and then die on the side of the road, if I'm lucky. <laughs> but I can train for it. I can put in the hard work. I can put in the time and sacrifice, sweat, blood, and tears and I can train hard to run that marathon. It might take me all day, but guess what? If you train hard enough, you're going to make it. So we're going to kind of unpack this idea this morning of training versus trying. So have you ever asked yourself the following questions, any of them? Am I moving forward spiritually? Or maybe that's phrased kind of like, well, am I stagnant? Have I just stopped moving? Or how about, man, am I moving backwards? And maybe you've had feelings that, that God is so disappointed in you and he says things like, you did that again? You're still struggling with that? I, I thought we were past this. Are you kidding me? Here's something cool. Here's something great. And we see this over and over in the life of Jesus. Jesus always called people to a higher standard but he never condemned them when they fell short. I'm going to say that again, because I, I guarantee you someone needs to hear it. 
Jesus has called you to live at a higher standard, but he will never condemn you when you fall short. Uh, the word will convict you, oh, 100%. The Spirit will convict you in your shortcomings. But in that conviction is God's grace and his love and his mercy. Now, Jesus was the ultimate encourager. He was always cheering people on. That's why people were constantly flocking to him. He brought life and joy and excitement to their days. Those who felt least worthy and most rejected in this world felt the most loved and accepted by Jesus. The same should be with you and with the church. Anyone and everyone is welcome, no matter their past, no matter the situation they are in. But, there's that, that awful but, right? But we just love them too much to leave them there. Jesus accepted you in the middle of of your sin. Don't ever forget that. He just loved you too much to leave you there. It's really encouraging for me at least uh, to read through the Bible and see some of my spiritual heroes going through some of the same stuff that I go through. One of my favorites is David from the Old Testament. I love King David. Right? He is a man after God's own heart. Look at his life. Think about it for a minute. He was a lying, murdering, adulterous. I don't fall into all of those categories. Neither do you, hopefully. But he was a man after God's own heart. Our shortcomings aren't what define us. It's God that defines us. Satan knows your name and calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, and yet he calls you by your name. There's a big difference. Right? We're going to look at a passage here in the chapter, uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, where it really sounds like the whole church had faded away uh, from God. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5, our main text this morning, uh, verses 11 through 6, 3. Sounds like a bunch. It's not, I promise. Um, but it looks like in just these short verses, like the whole church has just fallen away. Now, we need to understand that God looks at us as individuals, 100%. But He also looks at us... At, as a body of believers. The spiritual temperature of a church is important to God. Right? We, as a church, will reproduce not just what we say, but what we do as well. Your spiritual maturity is bigger than just you. It impacts others. What if as a church, we doubled? What if next Sunday, there's 250 people sitting in here? Right, we've got fans all on high because we're all sweating. What if we just doubled and all the new people had the same passion and excitement for Jesus and moving forward with spiritual maturity as you do? Would that be a good thing or would that be a bad thing? With that terrible question lingering in our minds, let's see what uh, God has to say. Hebrews chapter 5, verse uh, 11. There is much more we would like to say about this. But it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Hebrews 6 verse 1, So let us stop going over the basic teaching about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. So what's the problem going on here in Ephesus? The people are no longer trying to understand and grow. They become stagnant. Right? These are Christians we're talking about here. These are believers. These are followers of Jesus that we're talking about. 
the author is not saying that they have given up on God. What he's saying is they've given up on moving forward in spiritual maturity. They're just okay. We're never called to be just okay. I hope you guys realize that we are called to strive for more. You are told to do the best you can in everything you do. Everything. Being okay is not okay. We strive for more. We don't live in that complacency. Now, this is a very weird uh, bit of Scripture here because we're looking at this idea that um, these Christians, these followers of Jesus, well, they kind of given up on growing spiritually. Is it possible to be at church every weekend and no longer be trying to go closer to Jesus? The answer is yes. I don't know how you get there. I hope and I pray I never get there and I hope none of you do as well. But it is possible to just show up on a weekend and not really want to do anything. Right? You're just checking that box. The people in Ephesus still needed that elementary truth. Um, even though they had many mature believers among them, they still needed the milk. They were still not ready for solid food. Why would someone not want to grow spiritually? Have you ever thought about that question? I think it's an easy answer. Uh, because it's hard and it's dangerous. Why do I say that? Well, I, 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 I kind of live off uh, a gentleman named Sinclair Ferguson. This is what he said. Spiritual growth depends on two things. First, a willingness to live according to the Word of God. Second, a willingness to take whatever consequences emerge as a result. So growing spiritually is hard. You have to live according to the Word of God, which calls you to live at a standard that you cannot meet on your own willpower, period. It's hard to live according to the Word of God because he says, love your enemies no matter what they do. Well, it's difficult at times, isn't it? And then the next one, be willing to accept the consequences of living according to the Word of God. And we live in very real consequences. Now, here in the Western world, especially the United States, uh, we do face some persecution, 100%, absolutely. Nothing like our brothers and sisters and say, I don't know, Iran or Africa or India, China, Russia, the list goes on and on and on, where they're being persecuted uh, by being beaten, thrown in jail, or even death. Beautiful part about God um, is when the church is persecuted, and I mean pushed down on hard, that fire grows. You know where the fastest growing church in the world is? Iran, where they're being murdered for their faith, and yet they are exploding in growth to the point where churches are beginning to meet openly. I met a gentleman who runs a church in down, downtown Baghdad. And it says Christian church on the outside of his building. And it is bombed and broken into and torn up and tear, just every single week somebody wrecks that place. And every week they rebuild it. And the church is growing and flourishing out of that. So persecution is real. It's hard. This is some of the consequences of living according to the Word of God. Now, the author of Hebrews, um, if you kind of look into this, in between the lines a little bit, this is just my take, right? It's not the Word of God. Um, but, you know, how about you should be off the bottle by now and on to steak? Who here would rather be on a bottle than steak? No one, because steak is, is a blessing from God. Right? You need to grow up spiritually. Every time someone offends you in the slightest bit, we get hurt and we take it personally. But every time uh, the pastor challenges you to do something out of your comfort zone and you completely ignore it, I'm guilty of that. 100% I'm guilty of that. How about when we, we freak out when we have to wait a couple extra minutes because someone's running behind? Maybe that not, might not be you, but my family can attest that that's, that's me. I'm an on-time kind of guy. I, live by the, I was raised by the motto, if you're late, or if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Right? And when we get pushed behind, uh, my anxieties start to run a little wild. It's the simplest things that can throw us off. This is the natural way we will act if we're left up to ourselves. If you're not intentional and growing in your spiritual maturity, then over time you will begin to drift from God. 
It's not that you purposefully walked away. You just got complacent. You've drifted away. Complacency is where faith goes to die. It's as simple as that. Why do you think God is constantly reminding us to go, be active, live out your faith? The author here gives some answers that I think are huge, uh, uh, not just personally, but for us as a church. First, understand God wants you to grow in spiritual maturity. He's not hinting at. He's telling you to. Okay, He wants you to grow spiritually. How many people here want to be a mature believer in Jesus? Every hand goes up. Right? That's what we want. We strive for that, no matter what. Right? We strive to be better. So it would be a waste of time for me to sit here and rail on, on you about the simplest thing, those elementary truths. Well, we're going to talk about those elementary truths probably every single weekend at some point because we need the reminding. But the question still stands. Like, why, what, how mature do we want to be? The answer is kind of simple. I think about it this way. Um, like, I look at my, my children. When it comes to growing spiritually, um, I want my kids to be better off than I was. That means I have to lead by example. I have to live that, and I have to grow myself. And I need to encourage them to grow. Just like w with your kids, you want them to have a better life than you did. Well, that goes as well for spirituality. We want them to be better off than we were. I don't want my kids to have to suffer and struggle with the same things that I did. So I encourage them. I push them, sometimes kicking and screaming. Uh, uh, but we encourage them to grow up in their faith. We all want the end results, especially in, in the Western world where we are an instant gratification kind of culture. If you don't believe me, you've got that, that evil little smart box either in your pocket or your purse where you can get the answer to almost anything that fast. Right, I, used to, I haven't figured out how to have things delivered here yet. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I can with Amazon, um, but I used to have one-click purchase with Amazon. Pull it up, boop, two days later, I had it. And when it took three days, I was frustrated. Like, what do you mean I don't have it in two days? Two-day guarantee. I don't care that the roads are closed because of a snowstorm. Which we don't, rather don't have to really worry about that so much down here. Um, but we had that instant gratification. Like, we want it, and we want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to have to go through the hard work of getting it. We want to be mature and maturing. It's the getting there that's the problem. You want a deep faith? You want a faith that will take you beyond getting mad at the drop of a hat? You want to not get stressed over all the little stuff? Put in the work. Train. Don't just try. Train. We want to be people who are kind and forgiving. We want to be secure in who we are as God's sons and daughters. We don't want to be devastated every time someone critiques us. We want to be full of joy so that people can see that in our lives and strive for something like that in their own life. That doesn't happen by accident. We want God at the end of our story to say, well done, good and faithful servant. The first thing we need to know is that all the stuff that we want when it comes to that spiritual uh, uh, maturity, the growing, the influence, all those things that we want to have, God wants for us as well. Why? Because your spiritual maturity is bigger than just you. It impacts others. Next, we learn how. So we need to stop trying, start training. Look at Hebrews 5, uh, verse 14. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through what? training, have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Uh, the passage says, through training. They were responsible for training themselves. Let that sink in for a minute. They were responsible for the training. Not God. Not their pastor. Not their elders. Not their parents. Not their small group leaders. Themselves. I want to clarify. Let me... <laughs> Hear me out. When it comes to receiving Christ, it is completely God's work. You can't do anything to be saved. That is 100% God. But when it comes to growing up in our faith, we play a vital role. 
while we have a really important role in spiritual maturity, um, it's not all up to us to move forward. God is the one who actually enables us to grow. I talked, I guess, a little bit about it this morning in Sunday school. I want to say it's kind of a shortfall in, in this idea of free will. Um, but in free will, God allows you to grow spiritually mature as much as you want to grow. Now, he wants you to be a spiritual hero, standing out on, uh, in, in your faith no matter what. But it's you that has to get there. You have to train. You have to put in the work. God is not going to force that on you. It's the beauty of free will. God allows us to move as far as we want to move. He will never force you there. He will give you ample opportunities to get there. Um, he will remind you and convict you when you're falling short. He will try to nudge you along through the word and through friends. But you have to put in the work. At the same time, it's not like we can just turn on some engine or right? expect God to make us grow automatically. Uh, so our job is more like a sailboat. If you've ever been on a sailboat or know anybody that owns one, they don't just go out on the boat. They look at the weather. They look at things to make sure they're going to be able to, to go. They're not just going to sit out in the middle of the lake and just float. They're going to want to move. Right? We are to put ourselves in a place and schedule our lives in a way that God meets us and moves us towards Him. We have a part to play. This is a huge point for us to grasp when, when it comes to growing in spiritual maturity. Okay, we need to realize uh, there is an immense difference between training and, and trying to do something. Trying is just going out and trying. If you fail, ah, uh, you know, move on. Training is we go out and we fail. We try harder. We keep going out. We keep training. We keep putting ourselves out there. Um, if you don't believe me, listen to what uh, God has to say through the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Okay, uh, we, followers of Jesus, are training for something greater. He doesn't say just the athletes that train. He says, but we do it for an eternal prize, meaning we train just as hard as the athletes do, just as hard as the Olympians do. We train. Our prize is just something bigger. Training methods used to grow us, they have a, a Christian term for these. They're called spiritual disciplines. Now, we know about spiritual disciplines. Um, they're valuable because they enable us to do what we could not do with our own willpower. Spiritual disciplines allow God to work through us. For example, disciplines like reading the Bible and prayer. Right? They enable God to train us to exude the fruits of the Spirit, which are what? Love, joy, peace, patience. Kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And our world desperately needs followers of Jesus to live these fruits out right now. Our world is not full of love. It's not really full of joy. Uh, there definitely isn't any peace. There's absolutely no patience with someone else. There's no kindness. We very rarely ever see any goodness. Gentleness? How about self-control? No, these are absent in our world, but that's okay because, well, the world's the world. We belong to something different. We belong to a higher cause, and we get to be that match that we talked about last week. In the darkness, we are the ones that light up the world. We need to live out these spiritual uh, fruits. A disciplined person is not someone who exercises a lot of discipline. I mean, that's part of being a disciplined person. But a disciplined person is someone who can do what is right at the right time in the right way with the right spirit. A disciplined person is someone God pulls along. So how do you become a, this disciplined person? Read your Bible and pray. Right? The Bible is the primary way that God speaks to us today. Prayer is the primary way you speak to God. And He hears you. The creator of the heavens and the earth. Everything that's existed in all of time or ever will exist. The one, the I am, creator of all that, hears you and he cares. Neat side note really quick. 
Um, God also wants you to be growing spiritually mature in ways that are specific to you. Not just general. He wants us all to grow better in reading our Bibles and praying every day. But he also wants you to grow in the specific ways that he has blessed you. I am not musically talented at all. That's why I'm muted during any of the singing. Um, but there are others of you who are blessed that way. And God wants to uh, take that blessing. He wants to grow it. He wants to use it. Allow him to use it. There are countless disciplines to help you grow in spiritual maturity. Uh, Dallas Willard, I, I quoted him last week. He was a brilliant Christian professor at the University of Southern California. One of his students challenged him in a class about something he had said in a lecture. Here's what he had to say. He said, good comment. That seems like a great place to end today. His TA came forward, asked incredulously, why did you let that kid get away with that? You could have run intellectual circles around him. He responded, I'm practicing the spiritual discipline of not always needing to have the last word. Our ultimate inspiration has to be Jesus. It has to start with him. It's not about moving toward an arbitrary line of spiritual maturity. It's about moving toward a person, toward Jesus. He left a throne in heaven in exchange for a cross on Calvary to make it possible for us to get close to him. Like, do you, you, guy, you need to get that. When Jesus left his throne in heaven in exchange for a cross on Calvary for you and for myself to be able to get close to him. When we really start to get this, then our spiritual disciplines move from something we have to do to something we get to do. That perspective changes everything. Understand that God wants you to grow in spiritual maturity. Uh, allow God to move your pursuit of Him from something you have to do to something you get to do. And if you're here this morning or watching uh, online or whatever it is, and you have not made that decision to follow uh, Christ, to take those first steps in your internal life and being baptized, today is the day. Okay, do not sit and, and, and wait for the right time to come around because here's the deal. The right time will never come around if you're waiting for it. There will always be something that comes up and gets in the way. So if you had not made that decision, today is the day. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Uh, Dearly Father, uh, God, thank you for your word. Uh, God, thank you for its conviction. God, thank you for its absolute freedom and joy, the excitement we get for it. Uh, God, the, just the overwhelming peace and comfort that comes from your word. God, uh, let it live through us. God, let our lives reflect your love, your grace, and your truth um, to the world around us. God, let us be the light in a world of darkness. God, let us exude love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control to those who are around us. God, give us ample opportunities to love our neighbors just as we love you. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.